One of the things I learned from um, basically uh, James's talk at the beginning is that you shouldn't listen to Scottish people. Um, so you can decide what you want to do with this presentation. That's up to you. But the one thing I am going to tell you about is what is the future in science? And one of the biggest futures in science is actually catalysis. Catalysis is absolutely massive. And I'm going to try and explain to you some of the reasons why that is, but I'm also going to talk to you about the origins of a scientific breakthrough in catalysis, which came from my lab. So I'm going to use that as a template to talk about the future. Okay, now you may be wondering, what is catalysis? So I want all of you to sort of look around this room, and one of the first things I'll tell you is absolutely everything you can see right now was made by chemistry, it involved a chemical reaction. Every single thing you can see was made by a chemical reaction. This is my office in Princeton, and if you look around my office, basically everything you can see right here was made by chemical reactions. If I focus on one thing, that's my coffee cup right there, there's coffee cup, and this is in fact the chemical reaction to make caffeine, the, the key constituent that you would find in coffee. Now, chemical reactions typically require energy. They're not spontaneous most of the time. And the way that chemists sort of demonstrate this is an energy diagram. Now, don't worry, this is not gonna get too technical. But the way that I explain energy diagrams to high school students is the following, is the basically imagine that every day you were going home, you would have to walk over a pretty large hill every single day. That would require a lot of energy every single day, and it would become cumbersome, it would be annoying because you have to walk over a very large hill. But imagine you could build a tunnel that goes through that hill to get home every day. That would be a, one, that would be a wonderful thing, and that's exactly what catalysis does. So catalysis makes existing chemical reactions easier and faster but more importantly, and if you learn one thing from my talk today, it takes chemical reactions that were impossible and makes them possible. That's what catalysis does. Okay, now many people have their favorite catalytic reactions. I'm gonna show you mine. And this is actually the global population of the world over 2,000 years. It's basically flat. And then at the beginning of the 20th century, there's an inflection, and we've now grown to be eight billion people on this earth. Now, as it happens, you couldn't have 8 billion people on our Earth right now if it wasn't for this one catalytic reaction, the conversion of nitrogen over to ammonia. It's an incredibly important catalytic reaction. In fact, it uses 1% of the world's energy supply every single day. That's how important it is. Now, why do we need this chemical reaction, this catalytic process to do this? Well, we need it to grow crops. We need it to have enough food to allow 8 billion people to actually be on Earth at the present time. And in fact, this is one of my favorite little factoids about this, if you think about your body right now, and you think about all the protein and the DNA and all the nitrogen atoms that are in your body right now, 50% of those nitrogen atoms in your body come from a factory in Germany. If that doesn't freak you out, nothing will, okay? That's an incredible statistic. In fact, so I want to try and also point out that 90% of the world's chemical reactions on an industrial scale use catalysis, and 35% of the global GDP at the present time is based upon catalysis. And that number is only going to increase as we tackle climate change and sustainability. Okay, so that's catalysis. Why am I interested in catalysis? Well, my part of this story comes in where in 2021, along with Ben List, we won the Nobel Prize for a thing called organocatalysis. So you might be wondering, organocatalysis, what does that mean? So I just told you what catalysis means, so I'm now gonna try and tell you what organo means. And to tell you what organo is, I have to take you back to 1998, and I'll explain why in a few moments, but what were the areas of catalysis in 1998? So there was two. There was the way that your body does catalysis, which is uses enzymes, which is something that's called biocatalysis. And then there's the most predominant way in the earth that we do catalysis, which is to actually use metals. 
This was developed by human beings in labs to do chemistry. And it's absolutely everywhere. Now, the problem is there's a huge, there's many, many issues with using metals to do catalysis. And I, and I can explain this to you in the following way. This is a typical metal catalyst. And even if you're not a chemist, you can see that you can break that down basically into two parts, the left-hand side, the right-hand side. The right-hand side are the metals. Now, many metals are expensive, they're toxic, and they're often non-sustainable. If you think about palladium, which is in your iPhones, or palladium, which are in your car, we only have enough palladium on Earth to last about another 90 years. Then it'll be completely gone, completely not sustainable. So we have a major problem in terms of using metals to do catalysis. Now, the left-hand part of this catalyst, this is the organic molecule. And typically, it was just used to hold the metal in place so that it could do the chemistry. But organic molecules are inexpensive, they're safe, they're sustainable, and they're completely, I mean, if you think about human beings, we're made of organic molecules, and we go right back into the life cycle. When we pass on, we go right back into the life cycle. So we are completely sustainable as organic molecules. So the question became, and one of the things we started to think about, what if we use only the organic part as the catalyst? And eventually this became known as organocatalysis. OK, but why 1998? Well, in 1998, I got a job as an assistant professor. And this was in Berkeley, over in California. I got this job. It was my first job. And this is a photograph of my very first group in our very first year. This is 10 past 10 on a Friday night. We're in lab, this young group, trying hard, really trying to have an impact, really trying to make a difference. And what were we going to do? Well, I decided I wanted to try and do this thing called organocatalysis. Why was I wanting to do this? Well, I was convinced at the time that <clears throat> all of these organic molecules are broadly available from nature. The second thing is, much like a human body, we're not sensitive to water or air. We're, because it's so abundant, it's incredibly inexpensive. You don't need any special instrumentation or contraptions to use organic molecules. They exist happily out in our environment, and they're non-toxic, and they're completely sustainable. So this is what I wanted to do. The problem was I had absolutely no idea how to do it. I had no good ideas whatsoever. But one day in lab, Tristan Lambert, who was a first-year graduate student in my group, a young co-worker, he came to me and said, what is the mechanism of reductive amination? Now, Tristan is now a very successful chemist in his own right. He's now the chairman of the Cornell Chemistry Department. But being a young student and my being a young professor, I wanted to run to the board and teach him this mechanism, which is what I did. And I said, if you take an aldehyde and an amine, it reversibly forms an aminoamine. And when it forms this species, it has the suitable electronics to do the subsequent chemistry. And it was right there, right then, I had what I would call the quintessential eureka moment. Because I thought, wait a minute, if you look at this amine with an alphabet unsaturated aldehyde, if that forms an aminoamine, that looks like a lot like a field of metal catalysis, which has been known for many, many decades. So to show this in a more conventional format, in this top equation, this is a form of metal catalysis which has been used for hundreds of reactions. And the lower equation here, if we replace the metal with an organic molecule, there's basically no examples of being able to do that. But if it was successful, if these were basically simultaneous equations, that means that organic molecules should be able to catalyze literally hundreds of reactions. OK, so we went off to test it. And this is the very first time we tested it in the notebook of Kateria Rent. We took these two molecules, and that's the product we wanted to generate. And instead of having a metal, over as a catalyst, we're now going to have an organic molecule. And when we performed this reaction, it worked. It worked the first time, which was incredibly exciting. And I always remember when I got this result, going into my office, closing the door, closing the blinds, and then jumping up and down for five minutes. <laughs> I was so excited that we got this result. But the next part was we had to publish our first paper. And our first paper, we had to sort of come up with a, a new name for this completely new area. So the name we came up with was organocatalysis. And you might say to yourself, well, what's in a name? Is naming things important? And it turns out naming things is incredibly important. This is Jean-Jacob Berzelius, 
very famous scientist from Sweden, who in the 1800s, he came up with vocabulary for science of things like catalysis, proteins, polymers, isomers, organic, inorganic. And the importance of names has carried forward into the modern era. Things like directed evolution, AI, nanotechnology, organocatalysis, they provide a framework in which scientists can discuss these very large areas of science. So that was the name. The second thing we introduced in this paper was the concept of a, what's called a generic activation mode. That sounds a very fancy way of basically saying this idea shouldn't work just for one chemical reaction. It should work for hundreds of chemical reactions. So the problem was, I said that in this paper, but we hadn't actually tested that. We're just, I was just being very bold in saying this. So I went off to test it, and basically what I found was this was the original reaction, but then we started to look at other reactions, and it went bang, bang, and it stopped. It stopped after three reactions. So at this moment, I started to have a panic attack, right? Because I've told the world, this is going to work for hundreds of reactions, and it's only working for three. That's very disappointing. But fortunately, I had two amazing young graduate students, Joel Austin and Chris Bortz, who had this very bold prediction that if you take this catalyst and you remove one of the methyl groups and you change it into four other carbons over here, they predicted this would now work broadly for hundreds of reactions. Now, to try and demonstrate to a non-chemistry audience how bold this prediction is, I always try to use this analogy. Okay. So this is Zlatan Ibrahimovic. He's a very famous Swedish football player. He's a football god. And he would do incredibly cool things. He was very bold in the things he would do. So I'll show you one bold thing that he did, which is this goal where he does this overhead kick. Bang. From there, boom. What an amazing goal. OK. So I actually showed this video in my Nobel lecture. And a lot of newspapers in London especially the Times of London, got very angry. And they actually said, Macmillan is Scottish, and the only reason why he showed this goal was because it was scored against England. <laughs> now, I think that's, that's a little bit unfair, but let's watch it one more time. All right, so... <laughs> Dang, what a goal. Fantastic, all right. All right, so... Here's the question. Can we do something this bold and have this beautiful outcome? So we went from this catalyst, and then we changed it to this one, and it took off like gangbusters. Other people started jumping in. Other people, such as Jorgis and Hayashi, many other people started developing catalysts. And now there's hundreds, now thousands of chemical reactions which use organocatalysis. So one of the questions that people often ask me are, what are the applications? What can you actually use this for? And there's a whole range of different ones, but I thought I'd just show you two. The first one is for flavors and fragrances, for perfume, for smells. One of the things I've loved about being in India is the smells are incredible. And as you know, smells are important to the world. And in fact, perfume is used in an enormous amount on a daily basis. And Fermanish were actually able to take a chemical process where they can now make lily of the valley in one chemical step instead of six chemical steps, which is a huge reduction in the amount of energy to make this one perfume. But without question, the number one application of organocatalysis has been for medicine and for making medicine. And there's many, many examples of this. I was at Merck last week. They showed me a new cancer treatment they're using or building using organocatalysis. But this is another one from Merck. It's a migraine treatment called Tulsegipant and they were actually able to make this medicine very inexpensively because they're using organocatalysis. Now, there's a third advantage of organocatalysis, and this really goes back to this idea of talking about institutions. And this is the idea of what's now became known as democratizing catalysis. What does that mean? Well, organocatalysis is so affordable, and it's so inexpensive, it's incredibly accessible, meaning it's not only taught on every continent in the world, it's now there's research performed in every continent in the world. And so people often ask me, where is the next big idea going to come from within organocatalysis? And I always say, I actually don't know, but I know it's not going to be based on who has the most money or who has the most resources. It's going to be based on who's the best idea. 
And that's something which for me is incredibly, incredibly important. Now, in terms of India, so organocatalysis, organocatalysis is huge in India. In an academic sense, it's performed in almost every department here. There's just tremendous work that's performed in organocatalysis. But also industrially, here in Bengaluru, companies like Sinjin, Anthem, Jubilant, all now use organocatalysis, but it's India-wide. You go to Kolkata, you go to Hyderabad, and there's many other companies which are already using organocatalysis, which has been fantastic to see the adoption of it here too. But I want to finish off by talking about what is the future. And this is just really quickly, we have to think about catalysis for the future. We have to care about 8 billion people and how we're actually going to go forward. And one of the things I'll sort of tell you right now is that there are ways to do sustainable catalysis. Organocatalysis, biocatalysis, photocatalysis, electrocatalysis. If we were going to serve the needs of this increasing population of our world, we're going to actually have to come up with new types of catalysis. Now, I'll finish off very quickly by making this one point. I'm going to tell you right now, with respect to climate change, we are one catalytic reaction away from solving climate change. That's absolutely true. So by a show of hands, I want to ask you the following question. How many people here have thought about climate change and think climate change is a problem? Could you put your hands up? OK, I think that's basically everyone in the audience. How many people here know that we're one catalytic reaction away from solving climate change? No one. So that's a communications problem. And we want to talk about hope. You want to talk about ways in which, for the future, we can drive people's confidence or ambition. We have to do a better job of explaining to the world how important these types of scientific areas really are, because we really are that close. OK, with that, I will finish off. And I'll just say thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.